All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA exam practice question series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're turning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. We'd really appreciate it. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. You assess a client who engages in repetitive vocalizations throughout the day, both when interacting with others and when alone. The behavior occurs across various settings, including when no one is present and when there are no apparent external consequences. In some instances, the behavior decreases when the client is given a preferred activity. Based on this information, which of the following best explains the preferred activity? So quite a bit going on in this question, and it's a good question to remind us that we have to read carefully and answer only what is being asked. The question wants to know what explains the preferred activity. So we've got all this information about the behavior of the vocalizations and where the vocalizations occur and when, but what we're looking for is the preferred activity. And the key information here is the behavior decreases when the client is given a preferred activity. So immediately we can answer this question because if a preferred activity is given following the behavior and the behavior decreases, that's gonna make that preferred activity a punisher. So let's look at A, socially mediated positive reinforcement. Well, we just went through it and the preferred activity is decreasing the behavior, making it a punisher. B, automatic reinforcement. Again, not reinforcement, we're looking at a punishment. C, socially mediated positive punishment. It is socially mediated because the client is given a preferred activity. So somebody else is providing the consequence. It is positive because it's being added and it is a punishment. Then let's read D because we always read all of our answer choices. Automatic punishment. Since it's socially mediated, it can't be automatic as well. It's either one or the other. In this case, it's socially mediated. It's positive and it's punishment. Our answer is going to be C, socially mediated positive punishment. Janet hires a personal trainer so that she can lose 30 pounds. The personal trainer designs a plan that guarantees Janet will lose two pounds per week if she follows it exactly. Throughout the course of the plan, Janet also walks three miles every morning. Janet is successfully losing weight after three weeks. When would walking be a threat to internal validity? Again, what does the question want to know? It wants to know about threats to internal validity. So let's first analyze or think about what is internal validity. Internal validity says we are controlling the behavior. Our plan, our intervention, our manipulation, and not any confound or extraneous variable is controlling the behavior. So in this case, if we have a, a, a situation where Janet hires this personal trainer, she loses 30 pounds, the personal trainer designs the plan that guarantees Janet will lose two pounds per week. And if Janet follows that plan, all is good. But if she's also walking three miles every morning, what might that be? Well, if it's not part of the plan, those three miles might become a confound. So let's look at A. If walking was part of the trainer's plan, that is not a threat to internal validity because that means that was the trainer's doing. He's controlling the behavior or the weight loss. B, if walking was not part of the trainer's plan. Yes, that's when this would become an issue and, an, and a threat to internal validity. We're not controlling that part of Janet's routine. C, if Janet failed to generalize her weight loss. And D, if Janet failed to maintain her weight loss. In both cases, generalization and maintenance, which is a sub form of generalization, that would be external validity. We're worried about internal validity. We're worried about us controlling the behavior controlling what we're manipulating. And if Janet has this extraneous variable that is affecting the outcome, that is affect affecting the dependent variable that we aren't controlling, then that is going to be a threat to internal validity. A behavior analyst opens their own practice after 10 years in the field of applied behavior analysis. The behavior analyst has seen countless children with ADHD and feels fairly confident and their ability to recognize ADHD at an early age. The behavior analyst starts telling parents during intake assessments that they'll be able to notice signs of ADHD and recommend diagnoses and consultations for the condition. Is there anything wrong with this claim? So this is an ethical question, and it's all about 
our credentials, our qualifications as analysts. We cannot misrepresent our credentials and our abilities and what we're qualified to do at any point in service delivery or advertising. In this case, the analyst who has plenty of experience, so 10 years, lots of experience, has no doubt seen plenty of kids with ADHD, but now they start to feel like they're becoming some sort of expert, apparently, on ADHD. Could they recognize signs of ADHD? Quite possibly, they've seen enough of it. The issue becomes when they start telling parents that they can start recommending diagnoses and consultations. In a way, they're sending this message that they are now qualified to not only recommend consultations, but also start identifying diagnoses, which just doesn't seem to be the case. So is there anything wrong with this claim? A, no, since the behavior analyst is not giving an official diagnosis. Maybe they're not, but by recommending diagnoses and recommending consultations and, and telling parents that they can spot ADHD, they're sending a mixed message that could possibly construe or possibly send the, send the message that they can, in fact, diagnose ADHD when a behavior analyst is not qualified to do that. B, no, the behavior analyst never claimed to be a medical practitioner. They did not. That is true. But again, it's the message they're sending. We have to be crystal clear about what we can and can't do as analysts. C, yes, the analyst is potentially misleading the parents regarding the qualifications. That key word here is potentially, right? And it is potentially misleading. If the answer or if C said, yes, the analyst is misleading the parents regarding qualifications, it might be a little more black or a little more gray as far as what the answer is. But potentially, this is absolutely potentially misleading the parents about their qualifications, which is something an analyst cannot do. So is there anything wrong with the claim the analyst is making? Yes. Since it is potentially misleading, that is a problem. A behavior analyst is monitoring a client's progress using a cumulative record to track the total number of math problems solved correctly. Over time, the analyst notices changes in the slope of the cumulative record at different points during the session. In particular, the data path is flat for short periods of time. What does a flat data path indicate? So we have a cumulative record question. What is a cumulative record? It's what B.F. Skinner used when he was first working with his pigeons, and it just is a graph that shows the total number of something over time. In other words, it never goes down. It, it only goes up. So it might look something like this, where as we start collecting more and more data, we're always going up. And it might get steep if the rate of responding is high, but is never going down. So what the question is concerned with is when it's flat. And so what would it mean if it's flat? Well, if it's flat, let's say at three, it's flat for three sessions, that would indicate there are no responses because a cumulative record, all it does is keep track of how many of something you've recorded. So if you have a flat data path, what are we indicating? A, a decrease in rate of responding. Now, possible, right, that if the data path is flat, there's a decrease. But if it's flat here, right, there's no decrease because there's just been no responding at all. B, an increase in the rate of responding. Well, this slope here would indicate an increase in the rate of responding because the number of responses is going up. C, no responding. Yes, if you have something flat, if you have a flat data path on a cumulative record, that means you're not collecting any responses and there is no responding. And then D, a steady rate of responding. Well, there can't be a steady rate of responding if there is no responding. So a flat data path on a cumulative record indicates no responding. Reagan just had a cooling unit installed on his enclosed patio outside. Reagan loves how quickly the room cools down from the time the unit is turned on to the desired temperature. When Reagan was initially shopping for a unit, this was his biggest concern. What was Reagan concerned with primarily? Okay, pretty straightforward measurement question. We're looking at Reagan, and Reagan was initially shopping for this cooling unit, and he wanted to know how quickly the room cools down from the time the unit is turned on, so this might be our SD, in theory, to the desired temperature. So how long does it take to get from the SD to the response. And this is where people sometimes struggle on the exam. This is a very applied question because it's not the traditional way we would use latency, which is the time between the SD and the response. 
but it still is as close to latency as you can get. This is why fluency is so important because it's not always going to be a clear cut clinical behavior analytic question, right? In this case, we have to think about if Reagan is worried about the time in between something, right? We know it's not going to be rate because that involves frequency. We know it's not going to be duration because duration doesn't matter measure time in between. It must be latency or answer response time. And we know answer response time is time in between two responses, which doesn't necessarily make sense here because Reagan wants to know from the time the unit is turned on to the desired temperature, how long does that take? So Reagan is initially or primarily concerned with B latency. Easy question, but at the same time, a very good fluency question and one that requires a little bit of critical thought. Thanks for watching. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Subscribe if you are enjoying. We really, really appreciate it. Work hard, study hard, spread the word. See you soon.